got a report from our senior learning designer, Ellie Davis, on the cutting edge of learning design. It's all about exciting and unique interactions that your learners know how to use instinctively, I should say, and can enjoy using learning from without even realising they're doing it. Hi Ellie, how are you doing? Hi Mark, I'm good, thank you. Great, so you've got a couple of examples from recent projects which are going to show people what intuitive interaction design is all about and how to go about designing it yourself. Take it away. Absolutely. Um, so this is me, I'm a senior learning designer at Brightwave. Um, the senior learning design role incorporates quite a lot of um, different areas of expertise, um, but today I'm talking specifically about interaction design. So Nick's given us a really interesting rundown of three fairly new authoring tools um, and the things that they can do. And authoring tools are great for easy editing, for consistency, and for having inbuilt user interface and, and interaction design. So some of the design thinking you might have to do has actually already been done for you. But there are times when you need to do something very bespoke, and so you either need a very flexible tool, um, as Nick has, has mentioned, or Sometimes you actually need developers and designers working from scratch or within a framework such as Waveform. Oh, can't get my screen to move. There we go. So why do you need bespoke interactions? Um, it might be because your learning point is really important and you need to align your uh, interaction with your learning outcome because that will give you the most effective learning results. It might be that you need something really novel, so perhaps you're taking um, a campaign approach and you're trying to spread an idea across your organisation um, and you want people to be talking about it, so if you can give them something fresh and new, uh, they're more likely to discuss it. Similarly, something new is also more likely to be memorable, um, and of course, you don't want uh, any learning to sort of be instantly forgotten. Or it might be that you're trying to digitise an existing device or, or design uh, that works on paper or in the classroom, um, and you now want to create it in, in digital learning. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that right now. <laughs> But before we go any further, um, I just want to address the word intuitive um, because actually nothing is inherently intuitive, nothing is intuitive to absolutely everyone. Um, but we do all pick up on familiar visual cues which help us uh, navigate around the world and the digital world. So things that uh, we're familiar with are, are just easier to use and we have to think about them less. So that means we're using less cognitive load on our brains uh, and our brains actually can't cope with very much cognitive load at any one time. So we need to keep things quite simple and straightforward to use um, with very little thought. So as we said, different visual cues might be different for say different cultures or different age groups, symbols, colors, etc. might mean different things in different places. So knowing your audience is crucial, um, but also uh, web design and app design have become really international uh, sort of global languages for, for everybody because we're all on the internet and we're, we're all using apps. Um, when we think about being intuitive with our interactions, we're thinking about a scale that goes from frustration at one end where if something's so difficult to use, your learners might just simply give up and go away. Um, to the other end of the scale, whereby not only is it easy to use, but actually it feels great and it's really satisfying. So we're aiming for delight. When you're designing interactions for learning, recall is also really important. So if we want to get new information to stick, then we need a memory anchor. So it's often something quite visual. And the Samaritans have this with their listening wheel. So this is a tried and tested teaching device that the Samaritans use to teach their volunteers um, in the classroom up and down the country. And it's how to be an active listener, so how to listen really well to somebody um, where they know you're listening, but you're not interrupting them. Um, and so we were given the, um, the task of digitizing this and creating an uh, active listening module. Now, 
we wanted to stick to this proven wheel device. Obviously, it's something that we know works. Um, it's also on brand for the Samaritans. Each technique on the wheel is evenly weighted, which is uh, a learning point in itself that you could pick any of these techniques at any time uh, to use, except the silence, which is obviously core to the whole listening process and therefore is in the middle. So in terms of uh, design work in moving this to a screen, you can see that actually on a computer screen, the wheel works pretty well as it is. Add a couple of clicks and, uh, and, and you're done. But what about phones? So that's a different kettle of fish. When you shrink that wheel down um, to work on a phone, it actually becomes quite small and fiddly to, to use and interact with. Uh, the text that sits on the wheel um, will shrink down and, and become very difficult to read. So um, what you need is a different format. And what most um, authoring tools will do for you is uh, they will adapt it down to a stack of blocks. And I think that was something that Nick mentioned earlier. Is that's kind of the um, go-to format for, for accessing things on a phone. And it does work. But here, if we've got a stack of blocks, then we've lost our wheel. Um, and our wheel was our, our, our memory, her car anchor. So we had to go away and, um, and think about this design problem and how we might resolve it. So I looked around for inspiration um, and I went through all the apps that I've got on my phone and uh, I found the inspiration I was looking for in the BBC iPlayer radio app. So it amazingly uses a wheel device. Um, it's familiar to lots of people. I mean, BBC products are used all around the world, um, but particularly across the UK. And it's related to listening and the concept of listening. So it aligns really well with, with our learning outcome, um, strengthening the message rather than distracting from it. And I got the sense that uh, whoever designed the iPlayer app um, had their own inspiration, which was probably a rotary telephone. Um, so keeping that listening theme and bringing an offline real world interaction um, into the digital, so you can see how those, those circles on, on the wheel sort of match up. So here's some screenshots from um, uh, our listening wheel when it's um, accessed in the learning module through a phone. Um, it's actually really direct and, and easy to use. You just use your finger to turn that wheel at the bottom. Um, whichever segment is topmost is the one that is active. And so it brings up, um, in this case, a description of the technique and then a little um, audio example of, of someone um, demonstrating that technique to you. So it, it's really satisfying to use and we, we haven't lost that, that wheel format. Now, every time you create a new interaction, you're always taking a bit of a gamble. Um, that's why tried and tested methods within authoring tools are really useful because you know they work. Um, when you're doing something new, you can never quite be sure. But we cut the risk by building on things that we did know worked. And so we, we developed from something that we felt um, very confident about. So let's take a look at another example which also benefited from the use of a bespoke interaction. So Brightwave sister company, Blue Sky, um, have something called the Flex Questionnaire. Now, this is a very successful um, paper and classroom activity, and it's something I've taken myself, um, and it's really interesting to see what your own communication preferences are, uh, what other people's communication preferences might be, and therefore how you can flex your communication style to better um, communicate with other people. So it's, a, it's really successful in the classroom. Uh, Blue Sky have rolled it out across uh, lots and lots of different organizations and it always goes down well. Um, and I was given the job of creating a digital version of this questionnaire. So how well will it translate to the screen? So I took a slightly different process this time and I spent some time um, getting feedback from people who had taking the flex questionnaire in the classroom, talking to both the trainers and the learners. And the thing that stood out from almost everybody, which is that actually it could be quite tricky to remember the scoring system. So this works like a magazine quiz or a psychometric test, 
and you're given a series of statements for each question and you have to rate those statements into which is the most like me, um, number four, and which is the least like me, number one, and then you've obviously got two and three in, in between. And so, although that's quite a simple system, it's actually quite hard to keep that in your head whilst you're also thinking about the question. So this comes back to cognitive load again. We can't think about those two things at exactly the same time, or at least not very easily. So this time, um, we, we took a slightly different approach and we did a lot of trial and iteration. So I wireframed out some options that I thought might work and then I spent time talking them through with the senior developer and the art director and we sort of printed them out, had them on paper, tried out what we thought would work, what wouldn't work, uh, looked at what different issues might be. And in the end, we actually dropped the numbers altogether and found a much more direct way for people to order their preferences. So this is how the screen looks now. This is how the question looks um, on a screen. And you just use your finger or a mouse to literally order your preferences um, from most like me to least like me. So there is no numbering system to remember. There's also another benefit, which was that sometimes people would give um, two options the same number, so they might have two number ones, and then that kind of messed up the scoring system at the end of the questionnaire. So with this um, system, you, you pick them up and you move them, but that automatically replaces everything else. So you can only ever have one thing in every one position. You're always uh, adjusting the order. So uh, that prevented that even happening. We didn't have to put in any error messages or, or warnings to people. Uh, that was taken care of in the design. And it felt logical to us when we were brainstorming it that actually uh, the one that's most like you sits at the top in the primary position and the one that's least like you is at the bottom. But just to make sure <clears throat> that that was definitely uh, obvious to everybody, then we, we put a, a scale on the side of, of most to least and that's persistent throughout the questionnaire so that it's always there for people to check if they need to. So hopefully it is foolproof. So that one has yet to be uh, released to its wider audience. So when I uh, get feedback on that, I can share it with you. But that's how we do it uh, at Brightwave. We design intuitively. So the design process can be intuitive in itself. Look at the world around you, look at what feels right to you, talk to other people, find out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and try something new. Don't be afraid to scrap some ideas um, or build on ideas. So I think when you find the one that really does the trick, um, you'll feel it and you'll know about it. Um, if you want to talk any more about interaction design, then do get in touch with me on Twitter or via contact details that Mark will share at the end.